Welcome to another video. This one is going to be about one of the most fundamental aspects of a CPU's architecture, instruction sets. We'll be looking at what an instruction set is and what their defining characteristics are. But before that, I'm Hakaru and this is the Ultimate Computer Scientist. So why do we use different instruction sets and why is it that GPUs and CPUs have to have radically different instruction sets like how Intel's x86 compatible GPU attempt failed. Well before we talk about the limitations of one versus the other, let's talk about what an instruction set actually is. Instruction sets are the logical definition for what a processor is, with absolutely no regard for the hardware that is used to implement it. It's literally just a specification describing what a CPU does and not how the CPU works. The hardware guys are free to implement the CPU however they want, as long as it takes in a specific input and a specified action is performed on that CPU, then the CPU can meet the instruction set specification. One of the things about instruction sets is that they can be as strict as defining every aspect of a CPU, such as its memory bus width, execution units, register set and list of supported instructions, or it can be as ambiguous as just the instructions themselves. But how could an instruction set define the memory bus width, execution units and register set if the instruction set is only supposed to define only the instructions supported? Well, it actually defines those things through the supported instructions. For example, if I have an instruction set that strictly defines all memory instructions to be 32 bit numbers, then a memory bus width narrower than 32 bits can't support the full range of the instruction set, which may be made worse if the device starts memory mapping at the high addresses and works their way down. Anything less than 32 bits is unworkable, but that's outside of this topic. Also using a bus wider than 32 bits can't be utilised, so the instruction set can define the bus width. Looking at the execution units, an instruction set like x86 doesn't necessarily define what execution units the CPU has to have. There are no execution unit specific instructions, just operation specific and the CPU figures out what hardware to use and when to use it. However, if we look at a VLIW instruction set, then the position of the instructions in the instruction word represents what execution pipeline that instruction is going to get executed on. Therefore, in this case, the instruction set directly defines what hardware that pipeline must have in order to support these instructions. What all this means is that instruction sets can indeed define more than just the instructions a processor can handle, but can also define how the processor is to handle it, including registers, functional units and the bus width. So moving on, you may have heard of the term SIMD, usually regarding graphics cards. GPUs are the most common processors that use SIMD instruction sets, but theoretically there is no reason a GPU has to be SIMD. Conversely, most CPUs aren't SIMD, they are almost exclusively SIST, but again there is no theoretical reason why a CPU can't be exclusively SIMD. But in both cases, there are practical reasons why we do have SIST CPUs and SIMD GPUs. Now before I go into what these classifications are, no, these aren't the only ones. Theoretically, there are also MIST and MIMD instruction sets, although neither of these have ever seen major success, although Intel's earlier attempts at GPUs were MIMD, but of course that failed. So first, we'll look at the characteristics of SIST instruction sets and what that means. This is the type of instruction set that x86 and ARM are. SIST stands for Single Instruction, Single Data. What this means is that I can operate on a single piece of data with a single instruction. For example, I can do a single addition with a single instruction. This is what makes modern CPUs like x86 and ARM ones so powerful. And by powerful, I don't mean powerful in terms of performance, because processors found in even graphics cards, long considered to be obsolete, are considerably more powerful than even current gen processors. For example, take the GTX 480, that thing is rocking around 1.35 teraflops, whereas an 8 core Zen CPU at 4 GHz has around half of a teraflop. So when I say performance, what I really mean is flexibility. This is where SIST instruction sets really shine. Now I'm not going into depth how this is, but SIST instruction sets get their flexibility through the CPU's implementation. As most of the instructions are independent and different, 
it can be left to the CPU as to what hardware to use and when to use it. This is what allows the CPU to handle many different types of workloads efficiently. x86 in its basic implementation had two types of instructions, integer arithmetic and memory instructions. There was no flow instructions and so the flexibility of the processor was increased by adding new instructions like that of the x87 instruction set for floats. The reason this is going to be possible is because, as I was mentioning earlier, instruction sets like these aren't closely tied to the hardware implementation, which makes it possible to modify the instruction sets as time passes. As such, over the years, we've seen many extensions added to x86. Some instruction sets, as I mentioned earlier, are very imposing on the hardware. For example, a VLIW instruction set, which I'll briefly mention, is a pretty rigid definition of a processor, perhaps the most rigid, as it defines not only the register set and the supported instructions, but also the exact number of execution pipelines and their functionality. Therefore, these instruction sets are very difficult to maintain over time. But I'll probably take a closer look at VLIWs at a later date, because they're special in their own right. Anyway, the extendability allowed by SYST makes instruction sets like x86 so flexible, as it can support instructions for most anything you could want to do, as long as you can have the hardware to schedule and process it, and add the instruction to the decoders. So looking at SIMD now, SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. What this means is a single SIMD instruction will be performed across multiple pieces of data. For example, let's say I have two matrices, matrix A and matrix B and I want to multiply the values of A and B. Then with a SYST processor like x86, remember I did one operation with one instruction. So the number of instructions executed would be the number of elements in the matrix. However, with SIMD, a GPU can, with a single instruction, multiply multiple numbers together like this. This is SIMD. A single instruction operates on multiple pieces of data. Now these instructions lose flexibility as they are most effective when you have lots of similar data to work on, like matrices. If you just want to multiply two numbers, then the rest of the shader cores in that SM slash CU will sit idle as only one of the shader cores has data to work on. So here, we can see how instruction sets are imposing on the hardware design. Now if we look specifically at GPUs, they typically use a variation of SIMD called SIMT, which stands for Single Instruction Multiple Thread. This is something similar, except that if I write a line of code, then that one line of code will be run on multiple threads, which are distributed to the GPU's SMs slash CUs. An example is this video that I recorded a while back when I got the opportunity to work on a NVIDIA Tesla V100. I didn't have much to do, but Shaw sure wasn't going to pass up the opportunity to use one of those cards, so of course the first thing I did was write a Hello World program to run in parallel on all 5120 CUDA cores. This is a single routine on multiple threads, nicely dealt with by the compiler and instruction set. This is how it works naturally on GPUs. You write some code that is then put on one or more threads, but again, you can see that this instruction set imposes limitations on how the processor can be used, as it means GPUs suffer greatly in non-threadable workloads. Anyway, there is something important about x86 that I want to cover. You guys have now seen why we can't have all the instruction sets as SIMT, as it leads to poor hardware utilisation in non-threadable workloads, and we can't have all SIMD, as it leads to poor hardware utilisation in workloads containing unrelated pieces of data. We can now see why x86 has been so successful in general purpose processors, because it can get a good hardware utilisation regardless of the data set being worked on for that thread count. But also, this does indeed come at a cost. x86 processors are blindingly complicated. Fetching the instructions from cache isn't too difficult, any processor has to do this, but decoding the x86 instructions is a very difficult thing to do. According to Ivan Goddard in lectures about the Mills architecture, he talks about the difficulty of picking out the next instruction to be decoded has, and I quote, 
polynomial cost. We also need to be able to find the start points of each of the instructions within the bundle. That has polynomial cost. And this is one of the larger factors in x86's power consumption. Now I'm no mathematician, but if there's one thing I know about polynomial equations, it's that they get pretty steep pretty quickly. This means that decoding a single x86 instruction per cycle is pretty easy. Decoding 2 is alright, 3 is tricky, and comes Zen and Skylake, where looking at the 6 to 8 instructions per cycle range max. It's incredibly difficult to pull off. In my view, this presents what I believe to be x86's eventual downfall. You just run up against a wall regarding the decode rate. Now of course, the engineers at Intel and AMD have come up with patchwork solutions such as caching already decoded instructions in their execution order for often used code, such that they only have to decode it once, and next time that card runs, they already have the decoded instructions cached. Other limitations here is actually getting instructions and its required data to one of the many functional units in the processor's core. It's incredibly power hungry. All the functional units required to support the wide range of instructions have to be wired together to all of the register file and of course to the dispatch ports. This vast network of routes and switches to get this data around again comes at the cost of die size and power consumption. Other reasons why x86 and other syst instruction set processors can be complex is because the scheduling of these instructions to the functional units is left to the CPU. Remember what I said about some instruction sets not imposing hardware design decisions onto the hardware. Well this is one. In a VLIW instruction set, the scheduling is basically encoded by the compiler. SIMS does, but to a much lesser extent. But in order for x86 and ARM to have the flexibility that they have, the CPUs have to do scheduling on the fly, and this adds complexity to the processors. These limitations all make the x86 instruction set incapable of being implemented as a single universal instruction set. So now we know about the limitations imposed by some instruction sets, we should be able to see why we can't just have all of the processors using a single instruction set. And hopefully, you can start to understand why some processors are designed the way that they are with the instruction sets that they have. Anyway, that was all for this video. I hope you enjoyed, and most importantly, learned something.